quickly before we begin, I want to thank our sponsor, our sponsors for today's program, uh, Genomic Health and Santa Fe Genzyme. Thank you for your support, and let's get started. Uh, first off, um, this is hosted by Zero, the end of prostate cancer. Our mission is uh, we lead the fight against prostate cancer to advance research, improve the lives of men and families, and to encourage action. We fight to increase prostate cancer research funding at the Prostate Cancer Research Program at the Department of Defense so we can have more treatments to end this disease. Uh, we, ex we expand uh, patient education and support programs, like we'll talk about later, our 0360 patient navigation program, and webinars like we're doing tonight. And we encourage action. We do that through our 42 run walks across the country, and we're having four this weekend in Tyler, Texas, Seattle, Des Moines, and Dayton, Ohio. And I'm proud to say that we're a four out of four nonprofit, four out of four star nonprofit on Charity Navigate. Um, the webinar tonight, um, give you a little description on that. A patient's uh, prostate cancer journey may lead to the need of additional treatment. Educating patients and their families about tests that could accurately determine if certain targeted therapies will work or not before you undergo those therapies can be key to improving overall survival. And that's why um, we have brought in our esteemed guest tonight, Dr. Canfield. Uh, Dr. Canfield is an associate professor and the chair of the Division of Urology at McGovern Medical School at the University of Texas' Health Science Center at Houston. If you want to follow them on Twitter, it's UT Health. Dr. Canfield went to medical school at Jefferson Medical College, had his residency at Mount Sinai, and did two fellowships, one at the University of Texas, MD Anderson, and at Pennsylvania Presbyterian Medical Center. He's an expert at teaching evidence-based medicine and urology. Dr. Canfield, I believe you're a father of three. And I think I read something about the, on the internet about you, which is, um, I know that's kind of scary when I first say that, but uh, uh, you like to make sure that discussions about cancer have sensitivity, compassion, and are always honest, and throwing in a little sense of humor also helps. Is that right, Doctor? Um, can, you hear me? can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, I, I certainly agree with you saying that. Hello? Well, great. Yes. Let's, let's throw it off to you. And then, of, of course, uh, again, my name is Jamie Burst. I'm the, the president and CEO at, at Zero. You can see here I've uh, done uh, a bunch of things, but uh, uh, let's get started with, uh, with our program tonight and hand it off to Dr. Canfield. You ready to go, Doctor? Thank you. Hello? Yes, we, we, we Hello. can hear you. Thank you for, for joining us, Dr. Canfield, and okay, jump good. right in whenever you're ready. I'm ready. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Steve Canfield. I am the Chief of Urology at the UT uh, Medical School in Houston, Texas. And uh, prostate cancer is one of my areas of expertise. Thanks for your patience as we sorted out all of the uh, audio issues with the webinar. And thanks for joining us. Tonight, I'd like to talk to you about um, a stage of prostate cancer that we call castrate-resistant prostate cancer. It's a little bit further on the spectrum of the disease towards a more advanced disease. Uh, and there's a new biomarker that is available now that can help direct therapy. There's a number of different treatments that uh, you may be offered once you get to this stage, if unfortunately you do. Uh, and sometimes it can be a little bit confusing about which one is best. And uh, it's nice to have some guidance on that. And that's essentially what we're going to talk about tonight. The biomarker you may hear that term. It's simply a substance in the body which can be measured and can indicate the presence uh, of an abnormality or a disease. And so in this case, the biomarker is going to tell us if there's a certain mutation going on in the prostate cancer which impacts how the cancer may uh, or may not respond to some of the treatments available. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, you also may sometimes hear people talking about genetic testing or genomic testing. These can be confusing. 
Uh, and so I just thought that I would review that quickly. Genetic testing screens people for inherited risk factors, something that you're born with and that's in your chromosomes and genes and may actually put you at risk for having cancer in the future. And so that would be something you could be tested for, let's say, that might then tell you, oh boy, I better get screened, I might be at risk for cancer. Um, however, when you have cancer, when you've been diagnosed with that, a genomic test can give us information about your actual tumor and how aggressive it may be and helps us understand the behavior of that particular cancer once it's already there. Next slide. Uh, this is a funny curvy graph that depicts uh, a typical journey in a patient with prostate cancer. In the, in the very beginning, all the way to the left, you see that line that says PSA, all the way to the left. The curve indicates that a PSA may rise in some men. This is our most common form of diagnosing prostate cancer is from a, a PSA that's too high. It's higher than normal. And you may have heard about controversies with PSA, and that's a whole other webinar we can do someday. But suffice it to say that uh, it's still a good test to give us a first early warning sign that something may be going on. And so that curve would indicate a rising PSA, cancer is diagnosed by your doctor, and then you have a treatment. Let's say you have surgery or radiation, there's any number of treatments. And a lot of people may be cured at that point, and that's great, and that's what we hope for. And that would indicate uh, that, that graph where the curve is going back down again, that very first little bump. And so the PSA goes up, you get treated, and then it goes back down. And, and maybe in a lot of people, hopefully it stays down. But unfortunately, in some people, the PSA will start to come back up again. And you see where it crosses that dotted line that says biochemical failure, and that means that the PSA is coming back and it's because whatever the treatment was in the beginning, it didn't get rid of the cancer. Maybe the cancer had already spread, maybe it was just too aggressive and it didn't respond 100% to the initial treatment. So we call that biochemical recurrence or PSA recurrence. And that curve now is rising up and the doctor's following it and, and we would counsel you about common treatments uh, most commonly in the form of hormone suppression therapy. And about 80 years ago, a famous urologist discovered that if we suppress testosterone, male hormone, uh, it can suppress prostate cancer because prostate cells, including prostate cancer cells, grow from the presence of testosterone. So if we shut that off, we can starve the cancer cells and essentially put recurrent prostate cancer into remission. It doesn't cure the disease, but it does put it into remission for sometimes a really long time. And that's the mainstay of cancer treatment for recurrent prostate cancer. Uh, so you're given a shot of medicine that shuts off your testosterone. And if you follow the curve in this graph, you can see it's gonna go down again. It's gonna go all the way down, hopefully back down to the baseline, almost like it wasn't even there. Unfortunately, like I said, shutting off testosterone doesn't actually cure anybody. We just hope it lasts for a really long time. But fortunately, we have other treatments that we can offer once it stops working as well. And now if you're following that curve on this graph, you'll see it start to rise up slowly. And eventually it's gonna hit that second dotted line that says castrate resistance. And what that means is prostate cancer will always be responsive to testosterone or what we call androgens. Androgens are just a, the broad class of hormones uh, that include testosterone. And so it's castrate resistant because we're shutting off testosterone down to below the level of what would happen if we were to remove a man's testicles or what we call castration. We're doing it chemically with the injection, but the testosterone is so low that we consider it at castrate levels. Even at those low levels, now the cancer is growing again and the PSA is rising. And so we call that castrate resistant because even though man is castrate, the cancer is still responding to very, very low levels of androgen or testosterone. And this is where 
uh, people can start to have metastatic disease, disease that's spreading to the bones or to the lymph nodes in prostate cancer. Those are the common places that it would go. Uh, it can happen, this castrate resistance can happen before we're able to find metastatic disease in somebody or, or after. And so you see that that uh, bottom green bar says metastases can occur prior or following. And, and this is where we start to introduce other things, second line therapies uh, for prostate cancer that's reached this stage. And it's also at this point after you've started some of these secondary therapies where ARV7 testing can come into play. And that's this new biomarker that we're gonna talk about tonight. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, one of the things that we uh, also like to think about is this definition of PSA failure. Some, some patients will have that question. Well, how do I know that the cancer is coming back? How do I know that this treatment that I'm on, this secondary treatment is, is working or is failing? And, and so it's sometimes useful to understand how we define those things. This testosterone of less than 50, that's what testosterone goes down below if you are castrated, if, if you have your testicles removed. And that's what was done 80 years ago when this was first invented. Now we have an injection. Uh, and if your testosterone is that low, you're considered castrate level. So you have to have the testosterone suppressed down below that level to be considered properly suppressed and therefore failing that therapy. And then what happens is either we see uh, a new spot on a bone scan or a CAT scan that wasn't there before, suggesting there's new disease growing or your PSA starts to go up. Some definitions say that it just has to go up above two points um, total and rising from what it was before. Some definitions would say that we have to see a rise two or three times in a row over a period of time, but the point is that the PSA is going up or we see new spots on scans that weren't there before in the presence of a very, very low testosterone. And that's how we know that it's not working. So we can move on to the next slide now. This is um, just a, a comprehensive overview of management at this stage at what we're calling castrate resistant prostate cancer. Remember now, the disease has come back from primary treatment. The, the patient has been on the testosterone suppression injections, and now the PSA is rising or new disease is spreading, and uh, we know that it's resistant now. And this is just a pathway that you can find on the American Urologic Association's website. Um, it's free to access under their guidelines section of castrate-resistant prostate cancer, and you can kind of see all the different things. It's too uh, small to go into detail, but I just wanted to let people know that if you were curious, you could find that on the AUA website. Moving on, I'll go through some of the uh, medicines that are available. So chemotherapy was the only thing we had to offer people with metastatic prostate cancer um, for a long time. Uh, for about 14 years ago, that was the only thing that finally came about that made any difference. It made a small difference, but we had nothing that worked before that. And the kind of chemotherapy that works in prostate cancer is called taxane therapy. Basically, uh, the most common medicine is called docetaxel. There's another um, newer generation called cabazitaxel. These work on something called the microtubules in the cells and basically disrupt the cell uh, by playing with that mechanism. So that's how this particular chemotherapy works. And we can move on. Another thing that's available for this stage of prostate cancer is immunotherapy. And there's a particular medicine um, called Provenge uh, or Cipollucel T, you see here, and it activates a patient's own immune cells to target the prostate cancer. And that can be quite effective. Next slide. If you have cancer that has spread to the bones, which is a very common spot for prostate cancer to spread to, there is uh, a radiation type treatment. Uh, unlike external beam radiation, which is high energy that gets sent from a machine and hits a spot 
uh, to try to get rid of the cancer there. Unlike that, this is more like a medicine um, that can be given uh, in your vein, and it finds its way to the cancer spots in the bone, and then can treat it that way, and that can be quite effective. Uh, and we can go to the next slide. Okay, but now we're getting to um, some things more relevant to this talk tonight. So there's two more things I want to show you. One of them is called abiraterone acetate. And this plays directly into the testosterone pathway. And so does the next thing I'm going to show you. So there's two medicines that you can get in this advanced castrate resistant state uh, that still work along the hormone pathway, the testosterone pathway. Or, or what I call the androgen pathway. That's the overarching uh, um, term for the hormones involved with testosterone, androgens. And this is just a chemical pathway. You don't have to worry about the details, but basically it shows that along that pathway, from start up near uh, cholesterol, that gets converted in your body through different pathways and mechanisms all the way down to the lower right-hand side where testosterone and other androgens come in. So if we can block that pathway early on and block the things that go into making testosterone, perhaps we can shut down testosterone even further than it is just from the injection you're getting. And so that's what abiraterone does. It blocks that pathway in a couple of places early on. And let's say your testosterone is around 20 from the injection, it can take your testosterone all the way down to one or zero. And so that's why it can be so effective at this point. And then there's another thing we can do, which is the next slide. Yep, go ahead to the next slide. And that is block the actual receptor where androgens like testosterone will bind. On the prostate cancer cell, it's waiting for testosterone to float around and attach itself to the cell. And that happens at these things called a receptor. There are specific receptors for testosterone. And when that gets attached, things happen inside the cell and activations inside the cell occur, growth factors, and the cell starts to grow and produce other bad things. And so if we could block the receptor as well, that would be a good strategy in this castrate resistant state. And that um, occurs with medicines that we have, such as something called enzalutamide or uh, Xstandi. Oh, and by the way, the abiraterone I should mention, you might have heard of it as Zytiga. That's the brand name of the abiraterone. So the Zytiga works through the abiraterone pathway of blocking the creation of testosterone. And the Xtandi that you may have heard of works this way. It, it blocks the receptor of the prostate cancer cell. And it can do that outside the cell. It can do that in various ways inside the cell. And that can be quite effective. There's also a newer medicine called apalutamide or Erlita, which works very similar to the Xtandi. And so now there's two things that you may be uh, given the option of using that work in this way. Okay. So that catches everybody up on all of the different options available in castrate-resistant prostate cancer. Uh, some of the most common things that you'll be offered, if that happens to you, would be the Zytiga or the uh, Xtandi, or now even the Erlita, any of these might be offered to you and work through this androgen uh, pathway of blockade. So the problem creeps in that prostate cancer cells, well, any cancer really, it's tricky. And anytime you start to treat it, it will find ways of mutating and evading your treatment. And that happens in prostate cancer too. So once we start to try to block the testosterone receptor or shut down the production of testosterone in very clever ways, the cancer cells create mutations, unfortunately, to avoid these things that we're doing. It's kind of like um, when you have a drug-resistant bacteria and you're giving antibiotics that don't work anymore because the bacteria has figured out ways of surviving without eating uh, that antibiotic, it doesn't hurt them anymore. And so the same thing can happen here. One of the ways that prostate cancer has been found to do that is by creating a mutation in that androgen receptor. And so 
if you go back to that prior slide for a second, you see this is, the, this is a cartoon um, drawing of, of a, let's say, a cell. The whole blue uh, circle there is, let's say, a prostate cancer cell, and the T is going to attach to a receptor. So if we could, if the, if the what we're trying to do is block that so that the um, product created in the cell uh, don't happen, but what the cancer cell can do is it can say, you know what, I'm going to turn on this receptor without ever needing testosterone to attach. Okay, so we can go forward to the next slide again. And that is a mutation that's known as the androgen receptor variant 7. So there's a, n a number of androgen receptor variants. So this is just number 7. So that's, the, that's the, um, the reason why this particular mutation is called ARV7. It's not a mystery. It's a, just a logical name. And what happens is, if you look in this blue box here, you'll see that uh, this is a representation of the different sections of this receptor. Uh, normally, it has three sections. But in the mutation, that's this little two boxes below the three boxes, where it says ARV7 there. You would see it's missing one of the boxes. And what the mutation does is it gets rid of the binding section of the receptor. And so now it doesn't care whether there's testosterone or other androgen around anyway. It just always turns itself on. So that sounds pretty scary. Um, it sounds pretty clever of the cancer cell, and it is. It can be pretty devastating and aggressive. And you might also realize at this point that if it can do that, if it can turn this receptor on through this mutation, and it doesn't care if testosterone is there or not, then it doesn't matter whether we're trying to block that. And so things like Zytiga and Extandi and Erlita no longer work if this mutation is present. So let's move on to the next slide. So this is a, a, a kind of a medical slide looking at survival curves. We call these kind of graphs Kaplan-Meier curves. And they basically uh, are showing you two sets of people, two sets of uh, patients, let's say, and what happens over time in terms of how long they survive. And you can see that both of this yellow, this uh, orange line and the darker greenish line, they both start out near 100. So let's say we have 100 patients in each group, just as an uh, example how it works. Then you follow the one group compared to the other, and on the bottom you can see survival, and you can see that one line drops off towards survival much more quickly than the other. And that indicates that in that group, the orange line, those people aren't surviving nearly as long as the people in the other group that are staying a little bit higher. Another way to think about it is if you look at the percent of survival on the left-hand uh, vertical line, there's 0 through 100. Let's just look at 50. That means that the 50% uh, of the people will still be alive at that point. And we trace it over, and it hits the orange line pretty quickly, just in a couple of months. In fact, the little uh, box there points out that that's 4.6 months. That means that the average person on that line only survived 50% of the time 4.6 months. If you look at the 50th percent line and you trace it all the way across and try it to get it to hit the green line, it doesn't even make it, which means that that wasn't even reached. So you'd much rather be in that green line than in the orange line. And what this graph specifically is showing you is in men with castrate-resistant prostate cancer, they were all tested in this study to see if they had the ARV7 mutation. The orange line are the men who had it, and the green line is the men who didn't. And so, of course, you'd much rather not have the mutation because having it is very aggressive, and it's not a great thing. But let's move on to the next slide. There is something positive, though, to learn from this. And these two curves now show you two groups of patients in each curve, um, depending on what they're treated with, right? And so in the first box, you can see that if you 
um, have the ARV7 mutation, and I just showed you that that's a bad thing no matter what, but if you had it and you got chemotherapy, which is the blue line, you're, doing, you're going to do a little bit better. In fact, you're going to do about twice as good with survival as you would if you were getting those androgen receptor targeting therapies like Zytiga and Extandi, and that's the orange line here. So that first box uh, graph compares people who had the mutation, which is unfortunate, but what happened if they got chemo versus the second line hormone, hormone therapy? And it's much better if they got the chemo. If you go over to the right hand box, you can see the lines are a little different. And in this case, the orange line is better. These are men who did not have the mutation. So if you don't have the ARV7 mutation, you're going to do better if you get the Zytiga or the Xtandi treatment. And that's what that's showing you. So we learned a couple of things from the ARV7 mutation study. Number one, it's best if you don't have it, but at least if you do have it, it can help us understand that you should get chemotherapy instead of the second-line hormone therapy. And moving on to the next slide, this is just a summary. Well, how often does that happen? Because uh, now that I've told you that it's bad news to have that mutation, at least we know what you should be getting if you have it or if you don't have it, but how likely is it that you would have it? That's a, the obvious logical next concern is that people would be worried and say, well, how, you know, how likely is it that I have this mutation? And that's a very valid question. Um, you can see in this first bar graph here, these are people who are just being diagnosed as castrate resistant and that they haven't gotten any additional therapy yet. Their PSA is rising. They've been on the injections for a while, and now they have to decide what to do. The orange lines are, are those people in this study who had the mutation. And you can see there are very few orange lines in that first bar graph. So that means that most people don't have the mutation at that stage, only 3% in this study. So that's unlikely that you would have it. And we don't think that it's worth testing you for it at this point. The second middle box of the bar graph is after you've had one course of therapy. You've been exposed to something like Xtandi or Zytiga or even chemotherapy, and that seems to be failing based on those definitions we reviewed earlier. Then what? Well, then it's time to check ARV7 because about 20% of people will have the mutation at that point. That's one in five people. It's, it's, it's common at that point. And if you have it, like we said, then we know we should give you chemotherapy as your next course of treatment if, you, if that's not what you've already had, for example. If you don't have the mutation at that point, we can try one of the other uh, hormone targeting agents. For example, if you've been on the Xtandi, you can try the Zytiga and vice versa. So it's very useful at that stage. And then you can see the final bar graph represents people who've been through a couple of courses of treatment and now the mutation becomes even more uh, prevalent. Almost one third of people would have it at this point. So moving on to the last slide. This is just a summary. I know I've gone over a lot of information. I've tried to take you through a journey of what happens and what is uh, available for men who have to face the castrate resistance stage and specific to things like Zytiga um, and Xtandi versus the chemotherapy, how we can use this new biomarker to try to determine the best next step. Um, and there you go. I think that uh, that summarizes it nicely and uh, I'm looking forward to taking your questions. Thank you, Dr. Canfield. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, we have uh, a couple of questions that have come in. Um, a couple of patients have, have asked, uh, how much does this test cost and will insurance cover it? That's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, it, it really does depend on your insurance plan. Uh, sometimes uh, people like uh, may have to fight with your insurance company. Um, the company tries to do a good job of doing that on your behalf as well. The, the test is expensive. It costs a few thousand dollars. 
but I like to, uh, but, but the patient is never going to be responsible for that amount. It's mostly we have to convince the insurance company of the, of the value of that. It's, it's nice to point out to uh, insurers that although that sounds like it's an expensive amount of money for a test, being on the wrong therapy is more expensive and can waste precious time uh, of what little a patient may have left. And compared to chemotherapy or Xtandi or Zytiga, any of these medicines are very expensive. And so the test is only a few weeks of therapy comparatively. And so we might not know that a therapy is not working for a few months at least, and now we've spent a lot more money and wasted a lot of time. So relatively speaking, it's not that expensive, and it saves money and time. Thank you. Uh, I have a question from our, our Facebook Live folks. A uh, woman asks, uh, how do I find out if my husband has ARV7? Uh, well, you, you need to work with your urologist or oncologist. Um, often an oncologist, a, a chemotherapy type of doctor, is taking care of patients at this stage depending on where you live. Uh, some urologists, like myself, do this as well, but hopefully he would have that sort of doctor at this point. And if he uh, meets these kind of criteria uh, and has been on any of these medicines already, then he may be a candidate for this. Uh, he would need to have the test ordered by the doctor. Thank you. Uh, and is it, there's an interesting question that we got. Is it possible for uh, to, to, um, to, to mutate over time and become ARV7? Is it so? Let me I mean, like, uh, try to rephrase. Is, the, well, sure. Um, if the AR genomic marker is, is, is present, so can it mutate over time uh, and alter to ARV7? Because it's right. So, genomic so, change over time is the question. Yeah, it's well. So, so let, I'm not. Sh I'm not sure I understand the question. I can. I think I can address it in two ways, though. Um, it sounds like the. The question is, um, does the ARV7 change over time? It, it, the okay. ARV7 is a change. So the androgen uh, receptor is that, is that part outside the cell that would connect to testosterone. Um, that normally allows that binding to happen. The mutation causes that binding uh, to become impossible, and basically it turns the light switch on all the time and doesn't need any binding. And so that's, that's already a change, that the ARV7 represents that mutational change has occurred already. It can't switch back. It would never switch back to becoming normal again. But what could happen is you could maybe get rid of it. So like I said, if the mutation is present, then those people should not get any more therapy trying to block that receptor uh, or testosterone in general because that won't work anymore. But they could get chemotherapy with something like the docetaxel. That may, in effect, wipe out those mutated cells so that there are normal cells again that could then, in the future, respond to those other treatments again. And how long has uh, ARV7 testing been available? Uh, I can't give you a good quote on that. It's been around um, uh, almost a year. It's been around for a while, but it's been commercially available as a test, I would say, for almost a year. Great. And then um, there are two, there are at least two bodies that talk about uh, treatment guidelines. One is the American Neurological Association, and another is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. Um, can you talk to do, do the treatment guidelines for ARV7 uh, mirror one another on what the AUA calls for versus what NCCN has for guidelines? Right. Um, the, the AUA tends to be a little bit more hesitant and strict with markers. They don't um, come out and, and say that you should do this. Sometimes they'll make a comment that these things may be helpful and it, it's, it could be a discussion. 
the NCCN guidelines do more often come out with stronger recommendations, uh, often recommending that markers can be considered at certain times um, such as this. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, another question comes in of if you had the ARV7 test and it came back negative, uh, could you later come back and it be test you it come back positive? Yes. Oh, a good point that I did not bring up during the presentation. Um, if if you recall, the mutation seems to occur more and more often for the longer you've been exposed to treatments. And so, for example, uh, after you've been treated for a while uh, for castrate-resistant prostate cancer and it doesn't seem to be working anymore, like we said, that would be the ideal time to start testing for ARB7. Let's say it was negative, and then that would open up the option of continuing with another type of similar medicine that might still be working on that receptor area. And so then you get treated with that for a while, and maybe that stops working, and then you could be tested again because the likelihood increases uh, over time of exposure to these kind of medicines that the mutation might happen. Um, just as a reminder, before uh, you've done anything and you're just newly diagnosed with castrate-resistant disease, in, in the main study on ARV7, uh, there were very few people with the mutation, only 3% at that point. After you'd been treated for a while and maybe switching to something else, about 20% of people had it. And if you went on to need a third therapy, uh, about 33% um, had it at that point. Now, for a man who is positive uh, for the marker, um, would their castrate resistant prostate cancer be considered uh, aggressive all the time? Extremely aggressive. So ARB7 is just one of the mutations that can occur that we know about and that we can now test for. Uh, there are other things that can occur that we aren't really able to test for, but we know happen. So there's a number of things that can lead to aggressive or very aggressive prostate cancer, but it does appear that this specific mutation is definitely one of them. And if you have it, it's very aggressive. Now, is it something that uh, a patient and his, his family uh, should look at uh, getting assessed if there's a, a family history of prostate cancer? No, uh, that would be more um, like a PSA, something early on in the screening process. If you have a family history, that, that does increase your risk of getting prostate cancer. And so a PSA would be uh, one of the best ways to start looking for that. Uh, this ARB7 test really doesn't come into play until very late stages, and so it's not considered a screening test. Now, at, uh, I have a question coming in. Uh, at, at what point would you consider uh, prostate cancer being um, castrate resistant? So that occurs when a man's been treated uh, with testosterone suppression therapy. It's usually an injection that you get every few months in your doctor's office. It shuts off the production of testosterone. And we do that for cancer that has come back or has spread. Um, and we know that at that point it's not um, likely to be cured, but our goals would be to try to control it for a long time maybe even letting somebody live out the rest of their life with it being treated and controlled. Castrate-resistant disease occurs when that strategy is not working anymore and somebody who's getting these injections um, is no longer in remission and the, the PSA is coming up and maybe there's even some spots on scans. So that's how we know somebody has become castrate-resistant. And can you share for us again how long on, on average will hormone medicines work? Um, that's a good question, and it has a little bit to do with how aggressive the prostate cancer was to begin with before it recurred and if there are any 
uh, metastatic disease present. So often um, after somebody's had treatment and it looks like the PSA is coming back up again, um, at some point that may be offered to a patient to start the testosterone suppression therapy. Maybe some x-rays will be done. So if somebody does not have metastatic disease in general, we would expect that the hormone suppression should last on average between three to five years at least before it might stop working. So that's a pretty good long time. If there are already metastatic disease uh, and the hormone suppression treatment has been started, then it may not last as long, but more on the order of 18 months, maybe up to two years. But, but it's not going to last as long before you become castrate resistant. And what, what would be the, the arsenal of treatment and, uh, and perhaps in what order might be a great strategy for men with castrate-resistant prostate cancer that come back with a, a positive uh, ARV7 mark? Okay, well, um, that sounds like a couple of different questions mixed in with one there. So let me just see if I can address each one. Um, so for castrate-resistant disease, we're talking about a man who's been on the injections already. We like to continue the injections because the resistance is only happening in some cells. Some prostate cancer cells have mutated and become resistant, and some of them are still responding to the injections, the hormone suppression. That, so we continue that, and then we add something on top. And that uh, can be many different things, depending if there is spread of the disease, what we call metastases. Metastases means if we do some scans like a bone scan or a CAT scan and we see cancer that's outside the prostate, it's somewhere else like in the bone, that's metastatic disease. So if, if that is present, then there are a number of things that can be used. Some of the things I mentioned like immunotherapy, uh, radium therapy, or more commonly the Zytiga and the Xtandi. Uh, and some of those things are also available if there's no metastatic disease. Uh, that's brand new, actually. In the past few months now, we've had uh, options for castrate-resistant disease with no signs of metastases. We used to not be able to do anything. We used to just have no options and watch the PSA keep going up and keep getting scans until we could show that there was metastatic disease because there was nothing else approved. Mm -hmm. But now we don't have to sit there and wait. Now we can use the Xtandi or uh, something else called Erlita, which is very, very similar to Xtandi. So it's, it's quite Thank complex. You, There's quite a number of options, and really it's best something that's discussed in detail with, with you and your, your doctor uh, to see what's going to be best for you. Thanks, doctor. And... Um, when does it make sense to to test men before starting, or does it ever make sense to, to, to test men before starting on Xtandi or Zatiga? Right uh, for ARB7, I assume. So correct, correct. So we we wouldn't. So it doesn't it doesn't make sense because it's so uncommon to have that particular mutation. If you've never had Xtandi or Zatiga before, then it's unlikely you'll have that mutation. Um, that, that may change, though. Um, uh, well, no, I shouldn't say it will change, but, but what I meant was we are now um, that we are able to use those kind of medicines earlier on in the treatment of men, uh, for example, before there are any signs of metastatic disease, uh, people will have been on those medicines for longer and more often. And, and so I think that we'll need to consider doing ARB testing more often in the future as well. Uh, but if you haven't ever been exposed at all to those medicines, then you don't need to get it checked. Thanks for that clarification. Uh, we have a, a patient on uh, uh, our Facebook Live that asked that they have just finished their second uh, biochemical recurrence of prostate cancer, but the PSA is still detectable. Is ARB7 an appropriate action? Yeah, it does sound like it may be. I'd have to know specifically what they've been treated with so far, but 
that's the kind of scenario where we're starting to think about using it for sure. Thank you. Um, is ARV7 a quantitative test or is it simply positive or negative? Is there a scale to it? That's an interesting, that's an that's a advanced level question. Yeah, it's, a, <laughs> it's, it's simply positive or negative. It, it, is, it can be quantitated. So, for example, we can tell how much, uh, how many of the cells are affected by the mutation out of all the cells we're testing, for example. But that doesn't actually matter. All you need is one cell in the whole pool of cells. And so even with a single cell being positive, the test is positive. Great. Thank you for that, for that clarity. Um, a person writes, our oncologist told us that we can, quote, unquote, trick the cancer by switching drugs. Is this true? Um, yes and no. It's hard to trick the cancer. It's pretty darn tricky itself. But, but what this test can help us with is knowing what may work next. Um, especially with taxane therapy. And so if your ARV7 is positive, then you should be on taxane therapy. And then that, it won't trick the cancer, but it can wipe out the mutated cancer cells and then make it possible for you to respond again to, to the other drugs like the Zytiga and the Xtandi. That's not a guarantee, but that has been observed. And uh, is, has ARV7 been uh, effective with testing for other cancers on aggressiveness or non-aggressiveness? Interesting question. It's, it's a very specific receptor only found on prostate cancer cells or prostate cells in general. Um, and so, no, it, it really doesn't have any utility in any other cancer. Um, are there any other uh, treatment strategies that you'd like to share that might help men uh, avoid uh, aggressive ARV7 disease? Yeah, well, there are any number of uh, interesting clinical trials and uh, new medicines coming. We, we really had an explosion of treatment options over the last um, eight to ten years. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, 14, 15 years ago, we had nothing to offer men with advanced prostate cancer. Now we have six or seven options, and there will just be more with time as things get studied and researched. Um, and so that's exciting. And just stay tuned, I would say. Thank you, Doctor. And, and our last couple of questions that we have time for, uh, is ARV7 uh, a test that's only available in the United States? You know? I believe I believe that's true. I don't know uh, anything about the um, marketing and availability in other countries. I I don't think that it's readily. I don't think it's available outside of the U.S. at this stage. And um, where can patients and their families go for more information about uh, ARV7? Uh, I think a good source of information specifically about that would be on Genomic Health's website. They are the um, sponsors of the uh, test. They market it um, and provide it. And so they have some patient information on their website. Uh, another good source just in general that I would refer patients to for prostate cancer uh, of all stages, including advanced prostate cancer that we've been talking about, would be at, at the American Urologic Association's foundation called Urology Cares, and you can just easily find that by searching Urology Cares. It's, uh, it's meant for patients, and it's very uh, user-friendly, easy to understand. It's got all sorts of information, so once you're there, you'd have to look up prostate cancer specifically. And uh, the website that uh, you were referencing before, just to jump in, that, that's www.oncotypedxarv7.com backslash patients. Perfect. For, for this listening. Uh, thank you, Doctor. It's been uh, a pleasure and an honor to have you. Thank you for uh, the presentation. I apologize for our, our audio hiccups at the beginning. And um, <laughs> an outstanding job fielding uh, an array of questions. Yeah, well, thanks yeah. for having me. It's been really a pleasure to talk to you and everybody, and, and thanks for sorting out the 
the audio issues I was getting worried we wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, thank, thank you again. I'd also like to say thank you to our sponsors, uh, Genomic Health and Santa Fe Genzyme. Uh, we appreciate it. We wouldn't be able to uh, uh, bring you uh, the patient education webinars that we were able to do uh, without your support. Um, for those of you who are listening, uh, if you'd like to get uh, more support in your fight against prostate cancer, I'd like to tell you about uh, three programs at Zero. One is Zero 360. It's a free, comprehensive, one-on-one -on -one patient support service where we have a patient navigator helping patients and their families um, navigate their way through insurance and financial obstacles to be able to cover their treatment and other critical needs associated with prostate cancer. Uh, that could be uh, getting enrolled, finding out about getting enrolled in Social Security disability. It could be about uh, finding a ride to the doctor's office. It could be uh, explaining and having a, a person work with you to uh, get your get your your get your your costs covered um, and and other ancillary things that that come up as you're fighting prostate cancer, so you can focus on um, getting get it getting better. Uh, another program that I'd like to tell you about is our our mentor program. It's a, a support network for newly diagnosed men uh, living with prostate cancer. What we do is we uh, match them up with our trained volunteer mentors um, that uh, represent uh, many different prostate cancer journeys. Uh, some of our mentors will have uh, often the same types of experiences that our, our new patients will have so they can um, work shoulder to shoulder with them to, to, to get through it and uh, share their, their, their wealth of insights. And then um, for those of you uh, online, especially those who are on Facebook Live right now, um, Zero Connect is a Facebook-based uh, online support group where those affected by prostate cancer can share their stories, ask questions, and connect with one another on their prostate cancer journey. And uh, you can go over there now, which is uh, facebook.com slash groups slash Zero Connect. And um, I'd like to thank everybody for, for their time. Uh, once again, my name is Jamie Burst. I'm the president and CEO at Zero the End of Prostate Cancer. Dr. Canfield, thank you again. Um, wonderful job, and thank you for, for answering uh, all of our questions. My thank pleasure. you, everyone. Good night. Bye-bye.